Chapter 1. Smoke in the Sky NASA astronaut Frank Culbertson arrived at the International Space Station on August 12, 2001. His 125 days stay on the space station was only a few days in when the horror occurred, making him the only American away from the Earth during the attacks. After receiving news of multiple coordinated terror attacks, the team quickly set up every camera available on the space station to capture affected locations each time they passed over the United States. It was a clear day, making it possible to have unobstructed views of New York City and the other affected locations. Unlike on average days, when multiple flights tracing their paths through the sky would leave contrails, all flights were grounded, save one. Air Force One. 9-11 started like that of any other graceful day until terror struck, not long after many businesses opened. The day before the Twin Tower attacks was a Monday, one that had a storm sweeping over New York City, which is a likely reason for the clear skies that marked the following day. 8 o'clock Tuesday morning, September 11th, saw people going about their business as usual. Early commuters were finding their way to their various offices until American Airlines Flight 11 struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m. Nearly every news channel in the United States was broadcasting live footage of the unfolding inferno on the top floors of the North Tower. However, the error narrative was soon wiped off the minds of all news crews and people watching the footage as United Flight 175 was seen flying towards the South Tower and impacting it at 9.03 a.m. This summary provides the documentation of the oral account of people directly linked to the unforgettable events of September 11th. Go through this piece till the end to take in 9-11 through the eyes of the frontline health workers, firefighters, security operatives, government officials, and volunteers that experienced one of the darkest days in American history. Chapter 2. The Doomsday Drill All news media went abuzz simultaneously. People were frantically trying to reach their loved ones over the phone. It was not business as usual for reporters, broadcasters, and everyone working with news agencies. It took great care and professionalism on the journalists not to mislead the populace about the severity and source of the present situation. But unfortunately, deep in the recesses of their hearts, some broadcasters saw the attacks of that morning as a reenactment of Pearl Harbor. Bob Edwards, the anchor of All Things Considered at National Public Radio NPR, had to continue his program live while struggling to refrain from using the censored words that were welling up within him as a reaction to the reports streaming in real time. A thousand miles south of New York in Sarasota, Florida, President Bush was at the Emma Booker Elementary School when the attacks started unfolding. At 8.55 a.m., he got news of the first hit on the North Tower. The president was reading a book with a group of students at the school and was last to learn of the second plane that hit the South Tower. Andy Card, chief of staff to the president, was tasked with informing George Bush of the attacks being an act of terrorism. The Secret Service, the Presidential Motorcade, and Air Force One had obtained this intel and were primed to evacuate the president at a moment's notice. Up until the second crash at the World Trade Center, everyone believed the impact on the North Tower to have been an accident. There was confusion among White House officials on what to make of the attacks back in Washington, D.C. There were still speculations on the circumstances surrounding a plane crashing into a skyscraper in downtown New York. However, as soon as they saw the second plane impact, everyone in the White House went into panic mode. All the top officials, including Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and other top aides, were immediately escorted by Secret Service agents to the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, PEOC, a bunker under the North Lawn of the White House. Chapter 3. Operation Spontaneous. No one was ready. As the clock ticked 9 o'clock a.m. on 9-11, the New York Fire Department began one of their most elaborate responses ever. 
Thousands of security personnel, volunteers, and officials from local, state, and federal agencies promptly converged on the scene. The inferno and immense loss of property cannot be shrugged off, but a more emotional sight for the officials, evacuees, and rescuers was the sight of people falling from the upper floors of the Twin Towers. They were trapped on the floors directly above the crash impact sites. One of the first firefighters who died at the rescue scene was struck by a person falling from the North Tower. At about 9.42 a.m., shortly after the Pentagon attack, the Federal Airport Authority gave a prompt directive. All aircraft were to be grounded across the nation. However, the disruption was not limited to local flights alone. Several dozens of transatlantic flights were also rerouted to small airports in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and other locations in Canada. No drill could have prepared the relief agencies for an attack on the scale of 9-11, yet all hands were on deck. The evacuation of people from the World Trade Center did not guarantee their safety as they emerged to the streets of Manhattan, only to face a new scale of hazard. However, only a few understood the impending doom and took the initiative of fleeing. At exactly 9.59 a.m., less than an hour after the impact from the fuel-laden Flight 175, the South Tower surrendered to the fires and collapsed. It was the first of the two towers to give way. No one gave the knives they carried on board a second look. They were allowed under the security regulations at the time. Garrett M. Graff. There were four crashes that day. Flights 11 and 175 at the World Trade Center. Flight 77 crashed into Wedge 1 of the Pentagon. And Flight 93. The passengers on Flight 93 managed to wrestle with the hijackers for control, but unfortunately, it later crashed in the countryside community of Shanksville, Pennsylvania, with no survivors. Chapter 4. Post-Impact Response Not long after the South Tower collapsed, it became apparent to rescuers and occupants of the North Tower that they too were in peril. The survivors of the collapsed South Tower emerged into a starkly different terrain from what they saw on the way to work earlier that morning. Only a few stayed back to aid with rescue work around the collapsed structure. The majority were too traumatized to behold the devastation that stared them in the face. First responders and law enforcement officials in the Shanksville area had to request assistance from local authorities from nearby counties. Officials decided in favor of this improvisation when they learned that the crash involved a commercial flight. 9-11 turned out to be difficult for teachers across the East Coast as they were laden with the heavy responsibility of informing their students about the string of attacks happening across the country. The task was a tough one for teachers in the locality of the Pentagon as well, as many of the students had parents, relatives, and loved ones working there. At the Pentagon, initial efforts at evacuating victims were spearheaded by civilian and military workers. Rescue efforts crudely involved co-workers running into the flames and smoke to search out injured and trapped colleagues. They tried to live up to the military's mandate of leaving no person behind. The initial uncoordinated rescue efforts in the first 30 minutes of the impact at the Pentagon crash site accounted for most people rescued. The South Tower was the first to collapse. In the following 29 minutes that the North Tower held out, a tense atmosphere lingered among those remaining in the building. Then at 10.29 a.m., 102 minutes after it had been hit by American Airlines Flight 11, the North Tower collapsed, its level-by-level -level pancaking giving way in almost the same way as the South Tower. When the second tower gave way under the inferno, approximately 2,600 people died under the rubble that fell around the World Trade Center. Chapter 5. Evacuation Efforts After the Collapse of the Twin Towers At the edge of Lower Manhattan, the most reasonable escape route was over the water. A group of about 130 vessels, pleasure yachts, tugboats, ferries, sightseeing vessels, Coast Guard and police vessels and fireboats came to the rescue by voluntarily offering rides from Battery Park and nearby piers. 
At the Wedge 1 crash site of the Pentagon, efforts were still ongoing to locate survivors. However, officials realized few survivors were likely fighting for their lives in the rubble. Moreover, a quick assessment of the damage done to the massive building revealed significant carnage. There was a need for the president to address the nation. However, the facilities for such a broadcast were not available aboard Air Force One, which necessitated landing the only plane in the sky. At about 11.45 a.m., the state of Louisiana saw Air Force One setting down its landing gear at Barksdale Air Force Base just outside Shreveport. This unique military base was being used as a simulation ground for a war game codenamed Vigilant Guardian. As soon as the president landed, he addressed the nation from Barksdale Base for the first time after the string of attacks. Before the crash of Flight 93, the president had given the go-ahead for a kamikaze operation that would have had F-16s without warheads crashing into the plane before impact. Still in the White House bunker, Vice President Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, and other aides were trying to wrap their heads around the scale of the devastation at the sites of the attacks. The atmosphere was so tense that the Vice President was at a point set on edge by different comms interference. Several hours after the attacks were confirmed to be over, the Secret Service still thought it unsafe for the President to return to Washington, D.C., so, after departing from Barksdale Air Force Base, the next stop of the presidential jet was Offutt Air Force Base, on the outskirts of Omaha, Nebraska. Did you know? According to a report by U.S. News, 9-11 was not the first terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Before September 11, 2001, a bombing in February of 1993 killed six people. Chapter 6 Preserving the Constitutional Integrity of the United States The day's attacks activated a system to preserve the continuity of the government of the United States, a classified system never before used. Within hours, helicopters from the Air Force's 1st Helicopter Squadron picked up congressional leaders from the Capitol's West Lawn and Andrews Air Force Base and flew them to a bunker built into a mountain and initially created as a Cold War refuge. As the confusion and crisis that followed the collapse of the Twin Towers wore off, though with heavy hearts, rescuers worked tirelessly to search out survivors. Multiple hospitals around New York City braced themselves for a large influx of patients to be treated for burns, injuries, and traumas. Some hospitals in other neighboring states of the East Coast were prepared to take on patients just in case there were spillovers. However, all that preparation turned out to be unnecessary, as the casualties were unprecedented. To understand all that came after, we must first understand what it was like to live through the drama and tragedy. Garrett M. Graff A stupefying hush lingered over the entire breath of the United States on the afternoon of September 11, 2001. The nation had been caught off guard and left momentarily dazed. This was symbolized by schools, businesses, road, and air traffic that went abruptly silent. During the attacks, the USS Enterprise, CVN-65, an aircraft carrier, prepared for a port visit to South Africa before proceeding on her homeward journey. The aircraft carrier had been part of a military operation in the Persian Gulf to secure the airspace in the region. As soon as Captain James Winfeld got the message that morning, he addressed the crew and announced a change in plans. The USS Enterprise sailed close to the borders of Afghanistan and awaited instructions of an offensive assault. A few weeks later, the USS Enterprise was instrumental in the first series of airstrikes on Afghanistan territory. By late afternoon, things were getting a little coordinated in Arlington. Fresh firefighting hands came to replace the ones that had been at the Pentagon all day, while injured personnel were taken to the Arlington Hospital. Air Force One left off at Air Force Base at 4.36 p.m. Eastern Time, en route to Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington, D.C. The president had decided in favor of moving homeward. Chapter 7. The Close of the Longest Day in American History 
As the president made his way to Washington, D.C. with an ETA pegged at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, the droves of congressional leaders secured in the Mount Weather bunkers were given the green light to return as well. In the early fall darkness, about 150 congressional leaders had a rendezvous at the Capitol around 7.45 p.m. That evening, President Bush addressed the nation from the Oval Office at 8.30 p.m. Afterward, Vice President Cheney was taken to an undisclosed location aboard a helicopter for the night. However, it was revealed much later that Vice President Cheney spent the night at Camp David as he had been protected as a designated survivor. Though it was a breach of standard protocol, Cheney was allowed to sleep inside Aspen, the presidential cabin at Camp David. But the reason for this arrangement was not far-fetched. Aspen is directly connected to the escape tunnel designed for the president's use on the facility. Several protocols were breached and compromises were made to mitigate the peculiar situation created by the string of attacks. Individuals searched for their family members frantically. They combed through the lists of survivors pasted at hospitals, eagerly looking for a gleam of hope. But unfortunately, some people had been out of touch with relatives and could not ascertain their safety until returning home. Interestingly, the captain of the USS Enterprise was quoted as saying something to the effect of feeling safer away from the United States border than his family was. That was the scenario that lingered during 9-11. I don't think that the young people who will be reading this will know the same freedom I knew growing up. Garrett M. Graff at nightfall of 9-11, an ominous silence fell upon the streets of New York City. Civilians, officials, and firefighters were still trying to come to terms with the darkness of the reality that just occurred. Bruno Dellinger, a survivor of the North Tower collapse, said he arrived home, removed his suit, tie, and shoes, and kept all those items as artifacts in a box. Did you know? Though the World Trade Center attack was broadcasted live on news media, the video footage was not released for public viewing until 2006. Conclusion With the dawn of the new day, Wednesday, September 12th, people made an effort to understand what had transpired in the past 24 hours. The sovereignty of the United States was put to the test, and the nation came off with a smarting scar. Many families were left hanging in emotional limbo for their loved ones, continually anticipating news of their rescue to safety, but also brooding over the possibility of never seeing them again. Rescuers, volunteers, and officials didn't give up hope as the rescue effort continued, particularly at Ground Zero. By nightfall of September 12th, only 82 deaths had been recorded at Ground Zero. These narratives help make sense of a day that we as a country and as a people are still trying to process. Garrett M. Graff At Shanksville, the site of Flight 93's impact, the area had been taped off the day before, and official investigations began the following morning. Debris, plane parts, and any other item recovered from the wreckage were identified and labeled by assigned officials. Though civilians did not have access to the actual site of impact on 9-12, a couple of impromptu memorials were set up around the crash site. It wasn't until September 13, 2001, that the economic terrain of the United States returned to full grind. Road, subway, and air traffic slowly came back to full ebb, albeit under strict security. Collectively, the United States and the world have learned from the predicament of the American people on 9-11 and are working at forestalling a similar scenario from playing out in the future. Try this. To prepare for an unprecedented attack on your territory, you should consider the following as all-around essentials. Prepare mentally by controlling your emotions and training your brain at handling tense situations calmly. Procure a safe underground shelter. Condition your body by keeping fit. For example, if you get injured during an attack, the likelihood of healing faster is relatively higher when you're healthy. Finally, train yourself in sustainable survival.